start of Log 2. My name is Carson Isaiah Shen, and I'm the head of the Mech Propulsion Systems Lab, owned and operated by Aegis Mechatronics. This is my second log for keeping track of our work for the Peculiar Robot Contest, or PRC. The Fighting Directed Laser Armament Mech, or FIDLAR for short, is a slower, bulkier mech that can carry heavy payloads and weaponry while taking sustained fire on the battlefield. We're continuing our work on the newest heavy mech by bulking out the frame and adding armor. Unfortunately, our requested shipment of alpha voltaic battery modules has been delayed, so we still can't start on the laser cannon primary weapon. Hopefully, this isn't another case of supply line destruction brought on by enemy forces. Regardless, the team is optimistic about the work being completed. The thighs of the mech have been cut, using another disposable jig in order to ensure a consistent fit across all legs. Thermal padding is placed under the armor to protect critical functional parts on the underside of the mech from enemy energy weapons. From the beginning, I've been pushing the team to implement a hollow U-shaped limb design that would allow for heavy armor plating to wrap around and protect functional pieces, while leaving access to the underside so mechanics can easily repair damaged parts. Manual welding appears to be a lost art these days, but as I've said previously, Aegis Mechatronics is a bit old school. A skilled welder is able to completely encase the framework for the calf in a short time. Our in-house master welder is capable of solidly reinforcing the legs with a steady buildup of weld overlay layers. Standard hardware is used to attach the foot armor, which is expected to receive more wear over time while traversing rough terrain. In contrast, Magnetized interface joints are being used for maximum mobility on the leg pistons. While performing intriguing work, we can't forget the mundane bits that will be needed later for electrical and other systems. We always start any closed pressurized system with safety measures. In this case, simple bleed valves will work. Precision tooling can be used to mark the pistons for cutting, but the hardened material must be taken care of with something a lot beefier. And as always, round precision cavities should be deburred with round precision tools. To address concerns of having the pistons exposed on the underside of the leg, we will introduce redundancy with two pistons per ankle. Everything I'm recording has to be done a total of eight times. Axles for the pistons have been salvaged from small vehicle drivetrains since the rotating functionality will be under similar stress. Our machine shop lathe makes easy work of holding and finishing the axles. Installation with a hydraulic press is no problem if everything is measured and machined accordingly. More magnetic interface joints were picked for attaching the ends of the pistons. This was another easy job for the hydraulic press. Spot welding with some type of cold weld material is necessary. Otherwise, the heat from a hot welding machine can destroy the magnetic properties of the interfaces. Installation is a breeze with a magnetic interface on both ends of the dual piston assembly. Aegis Mechatronics may be old school, 
but that doesn't mean we don't keep up with industry techniques. Reactive armor plating is used to protect the knee assembly. Because they are critical and exposed, we expect targeted attacks against them. After many hours of working on sub-assemblies, it is always a good idea to check the entire build works together. We are already using a tank hull for the upper shell of the mech, but even so, we plan on piling on more armor plating. A very lengthy process of measuring, fitting, trimming, remeasuring, refitting, and retrimming is not ideal for productivity, but necessary for quality. And of course, the upper shell we are using only has rounded edges, so everything is even more difficult to fit together snugly. Can't forget about the shoulders for the arms either. Those need clearance and more manual processing. Ethylene vinyl acetate is poured into the underside of the armor to fill out negative space and provide shock absorption for the upper shell. Hot welds were applied around the edges of the armor. I try to balance innovation with system maintainability and hope that attaching features ahead of their needs will save time in future steps. One such feature is the engine assembly. We don't really have functional mechanisms to connect to the power output, but it will be nice to have available as parts are installed. As long as the air intake and filters are attached, we should be good to go. Well, after the alpha voltaic battery modules finally arrive, Even though we are planning on a primary energy weapon, I can't resist putting a flat missile array along the back of the Fiddler. The thick frame of the array will provide additional metal to protect the engine housing from bullets. The missiles themselves won't detonate unless chemically armed. A hybrid recoil damper system, consisting of air springs and mechanical levers, will help prevent missile blowback from shocking the mech too harshly. Giving the missile array a modular attachment point provides easy access to the complex systems hidden beneath it. With the first weapon attached to the frame, we can finally say we're building a combat mech. All that is left for the upper armor is to add access points for various systems to connect through later. Now that we can see how much real estate we have to work with on the upper shell, we can position and attach the LiDAR equipment housing. One last install of open coil helical springs with spherical followers within the recoil damper system closes out a good day of effort. To our dismay, while the lab was shut down overnight, it appears someone with access was able to sabotage the mech. We'll at least take this opportunity to make the hip joints even stronger, but we'll need to remove the previous silicon seal 
using dimethyl carbonyl before continuing. The idea of rebel forces potentially being within our facility, or even part of our own lab, has the engineering teams shaken. The lab was already combed through under lockdown, and fumigation was performed to search for traces of DNA or fingerprints, but nothing has been found. Everyone will undertake their loyalty interrogation today before being allowed to leave. None of this matters for the audit, but I'm putting this in my own notes as unexpected impacts to work velocity and delay of progress. This time, we're busting out more machining tools to install large semi-permanent hardware that will be much more difficult to tamper with or destroy. While we're at it, the threaded fixture for the hips has not been able to maintain the angular precision we hoped for, so magnetized drop pins need to be installed for locked angles. The plasma cutter makes quick work of the thick parts, but we'll need to clean up any spatter that accumulates. After installing the first leg, the second one needs to be calibrated at the same angular settings to ensure the installation is perfect. Once again, this is a repeat operation, and after updating all four legs and dialing in the pistons, we can finally call this portion of the build done. One last thing. A small feature had to be removed for installing the last bits of armor, so the hole left behind was welded shut. We'll be open to addressing questions or concerns on behalf of Aegis Mechatronics, unless it is related to the security incident in which case you'll have to just watch the news. Feel free to leave your comments before the final audit is submitted later in the year. Thank you to our benefactors for continued support. This is the end of Log 2.